four this morning. Would you find that in your Bible? Uh, I've been preaching a series of sermons uh, on the functions of the church. We've looked at uh, extending upreach. How do we do that as individual Christians and as the church? We're to be uh, extending upreach through worship, what we've been doing through the song service, what we're going to try to do now through the Word and through is worshiping God. We, we do that through prayer. We extend upreach through prayer. Individual Christians ought to pray, but we also learned well, a couple few weeks ago we were challenged to be, corporate prayer, to come together and pray consistently. Uh, it's, it's the uh, command of God's and the privilege of God's people to come together to talk to God in prayer. So we are to extend upreach. And then the last couple weeks we've been looking at ensuring inreach. How can we ensure inreach? I'm talking about biblical, healthy inreach where the church, where the body is built up. How can we do that? Last week we learned that we do it through discipleship. Uh, we're disciples making disciples of others. And you and I, have, as we surrender our, our life to Jesus Christ as, as Lord, and we're followers of Jesus and we're to be disciples and we're to work at making disciples of others. So how can we ensure inreach? We do it through discipleship. We also do it through fellowship. That's where we come to today in our study. The function of the church is in fellowship. Fellowship. God has designed our body uh, in a certain way to function properly. If part or parts of our body is not working properly, the whole body suffers. Uh, we're the body of Christ. We are. The church is the body of Christ and we are to function properly. Um, the body's made up, our physical bodies are made up of many members, parts that have various function. The heart pumps blood to the brain. The brain uh, and, and to the feet as well. The brain is used to control the feet and the feet are used to carry the body, to support the body. And there are parts of our bodies that are seen and that are, uh, that, are very, that are not seen that are very critical as well to our health and the function of the whole body. We have inward, inner parts that must operate properly for the whole body to work well. If our kidneys are not working well, we're going to be in trouble. I mean, if, you, if your kidneys fail, you, you're, you're probably not going to make it very long. If our digestive system's not working properly, Properly, we'll be sick, sick and weak and we'll be in need of help. When all the members and parts of the body are working as they should, the whole body will function as it should. All the pieces and parts working together make the whole body work. Uh, the church of Jesus Christ is one body with many members. We all have different gifts, different spiritual gifts, uh, spiritual endowments that God has given us to function properly as His body. We have different, we're all on different spiritual levels, but we are also uh, some of us are passionate about things that others are, may not be as passionate about, but when each member of the body of Christ functions as it should, the whole church will function as it should. The reason that the church today is weak and not making an impact in the world because the church is not functioning properly. The body, the pieces of the body is not working together. There's no fellowship. I mean, when a church is weak in evangelism, weak in giving, weak in unity, when they're weak in serving, weak in loving, weak in caring, weak in ministering, weak in reaching, weak in praying, weak in missions, weak in fellowship, it's because the body is not healthy. Some part or some parts of the body are not operating as they should. So as a member of the body of Christ at First Baptist Church, Newberry, I need to ask you this morning, are you functioning properly? Are you functioning properly? as a church member. The only way the church can truly be in be the church is that when the Son of God is the Lord of the church and when the Spirit of God fills the church and when the Word of God is the ruling guide for the church, then the church will function as it should. We get a picture of a first century church uh, fellowship was evident and obvious in this church. What does it look like? What does it look like uh, a ch church being the church? What does that look like and how does that church act and function like? Well Luke in this passage we're going to read this morning declared the unity of the church the witness of the church, the generosity of the church, and the fellowship in this church. The true church functions as the church when we are together in purpose, when we're together in principle, when we're together in preaching and providing for the needs of others. So let's evaluate who we are in light of the first century church. I mean, that's the standard first century church. As we obey the book of uh, the Word of God in the book of Acts, we need to figure out uh, and find out who God wants us to be. And He tells us who, the, who we're to be and, uh, and what we're to have is fellowship in Christ. So how can we ensure in reach each member be 
being what God's called us to be, doing what God's called you to be, using your gifts for God's glory in fellowship with the local church. I'm going to ask you if you're physically able, would you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's holy and perfect word? Acts chapter 4, verse 32 through 35. You follow along now, for this is the word of our great God. The Bible says, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own. But they had all things in common. And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who, ha all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. You may be seated. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we thank you for your word today. And Lord, I pray your word would not fall on deaf ears or hardened hearts today. But Lord, let your word accomplish what you please, and let it prosper the thing for which you sent it today. Lord, challenge us to, as a church to be in fellowship with you and with your people, Lord. And God, let us be uh, gracious and, and, and caring. And, and Lord, help us to be the people of God using our spiritual gifts for your glory, serving you, Lord, in unity and in fellowship with one another. Bless us, Lord, as we seek to build up the body of Christ through discipleship and, Lord, through fellowship. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We're going to get some insights today in, in, about inreach and fellowship in the first century church. I want you, if you got your outline with me, don't you see, if you're taking notes with me, notice, number one, that the early church, they had fellowship in their walk together. In their walk together. And look in verse 32 again. The Bible tells us the reason for their fellowship. What was the reason for their fellowship? Now the multitude of those who believed. Believed. These early church members, these early believers didn't have a superficial or shallow or surface religion. Did you hear me today? They were the real deal. They were real Christians because they really believed the real message of salvation. They believed. That word believed is the Greek word pistuo. It means to have faith in, to entrust one's spiritual well-being to Christ, your soul to Jesus. They were true believers. Faith. Faith is that inner and essential bond of union in the church. What we have in common, we have our faith, the faith of our Lord Jesus in common. And, and, and our faith should motivate us to do everything we do outwardly. But it starts with our soul saving faith, our saving faith in Jesus. They had believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and their faith in Christ changed them forever. Uh, you, you know why a lot of churches don't have good fellowship? Because there's folks in there that's not saved. <laughs> they're not believing. Uh, they're, they're, they're belittling. They're not believing. Uh, they're attacking. They're maligning. These folks had believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and their faith in Christ changed them forever. They were different than they had been because they had been born again. And listen, if, you, if you've not been changed by Jesus, it's a good indicator you've not been saved by Jesus. When Jesus saves us, He changes us from the inside out. When we truly believe, we understand that life's not about us, and life is not about what we want, but life is about Him and what He wants. The early church had unity. They had fellowship because they were true believers. The early church had a unity. They had a single purpose. The early church's unity was a fulfillment of what the Lord Jesus had already said that would happen. Listen to these two verses. I put these on the screen. John 13, 35, Jesus said about his, his disciples, He said, By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Chapter 17, verse 21, John 17 says this. Jesus said that they may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may know that you sent me. That you sent me. Uh, I'm telling you, unity and fellowship is important to God. It's important to the gospel. It's important to how we reach people for the kingdom of God. 
John MacArthur said the basis of their shared life was twofold. First, they were, were preoccupied with ministering to each other. So intent were they on meeting each other's needs that they had no concern for gratifying their own desires. Theirs was a humility stemming from seeming them, seeing themselves in relation to Jesus Christ and others as more important than themselves. Second, they were focused beyond themselves to reaching the lost world with the truth of the gospel. That left them little time to bother with trivial personal matters. Their unity stemmed from focusing on those priorities Jesus had left them. Selflessly loving each other and reaching a lost world. So that's, why, why, why were they unified, preacher? Because they believed. They were believers. <laughs> and that's, that's why. That's what held, that was the glue that held them together. They were saved by the grace of God. They had believed the gospel. They were believers. Notice the result of their unity in verse 32. Three things I want to talk about, the three results of their unity. First of all, don't you notice their togetherness in spirit. Look at this in verse 32. Those who believe were of one heart and one soul. Well, that's the result of their, these disciples' belief. Uh, they came together. They were unified in principle and in practice. They came together for the cause of Christ. Heart and soul. That tells me that being a Christian is more than outward. As a matter of fact, first and foremost, it's inward. It's inward. God changes people's hearts and saves people's souls, and that results in a new person with a new outward disposition. It affects you. It really does. God changes us. The believers were of one heart and one soul. They were not divided, but they were united in Christ. How many churches are divided today? I mean, I, I don't, I'm not talking about other denominations, the whole so-called Christian church divided by so many different denominations. I mean, sometimes Baptists can't even get along. Amen? <laughs> I'm not talking about all these other denominations. I'm talking about Baptists. And who's right and who's wrong? Man, we fuss and fight about that still saying, Jesus, may your will be done. <laughs> Lord, may you be glorified. The late Fred Holloman was a Southern Baptist pastor who served for more than three decades as a chaplain uh, of the Kansas Upper House. He was famous for his poetic, humorous prayers that respond, resonated with serious truth in them. He later included them in a number of these prayers in a 2005 book that he wrote entitled Book of Uncommon Prayers. Uh, on one occasion, he kicked off the state senate session by praying. Listen to this. He prayed, Omniscient Father, help us to know who is telling the truth. One side tells us one thing and the other's just the opposite. And if neither side is telling the truth, we would like to know that too. He said, and if each side is telling half truth, give us the wisdom to put the right half together in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Can I tell you the church, the early church didn't have to, you didn't have to pray that prayer because they were together in one heart and one soul. It wasn't one half truth over here and half there. Who's leading us astray? Uh, and they weren't like Congress or politics. Son, they were together for the cause of Christ. The result of their belief was that they were of one heart and one soul. They were in tune with the Spirit and they were in touch with the saints. And if you're in tune with the Spirit, you will be in touch with the saints. The result was that the church was of one heart and one soul. What does that mean? Does that mean that we're cookie-cutter Christians? Man, if you don't fit into this cookie-cutter, you're not a Christian. <laughs> well, if you don't fit into this, you're not a Christian. Amen. <laughs> you don't conform your life to the Word of God. But that doesn't mean that we're going to have the same likes and the same agreement on everything. On food you eat, you may like stuff that I, I don't like. Uh, you probably do. There's a good chance that you do. Uh, and I may like stuff that you don't like. I, I mean, I've been here 11 years. I have not converted one of y'all to be an Alabama fan. <laughs> and that's okay. Y'all have not converted me to be a Florida Gator fan. <laughs> Amen. But we're not, but we're not, cut it. that's not what he's talking about, being one heart, one, one soul. Our Kenny Hughes had a good word about this. He said, this does not mean these believers saw everything eye to eye. It is wrong to suppose, as sadly some do, that when believers dwell in unity, they will carry the same Bible, read the same books, promote the same styles, educate their children the same way, have the same likes and dislikes, that they will become Christian clones. The fact is, the insistence that others be just like us is one of the most disunifying mindsets a church can have have because it instills a judgmental flexibility that hurls people away from the church with lethal force. One of the wonders of Christ is that he honors our individuality while bringing us into unity. And he does. 
Luke testifies that the early church was not out for themselves. Uh, they didn't have a selfish inward look that motivated them to guard their stuff, but they had a selfless outward look that mo moved them to give their stuff. Luke tells us about the, their togetherness in spirit. Is that what we have at First Baptist Church? Are we in, in tune with the Spirit of God, and are we together in spirit, in uh, one heart and one soul? Not only did we see their togetherness in the Spirit, notice their testimony in their speaking. Verse 32 says this again, uh, Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own. I mean, what an outstanding phenomena in the early church. There's a lot of folks that talk Christianity, but not many walk Christianity. Our, our talk, our walk needs to back up our talk. We need to say the right things, amen? They, did, they were. They were saying uh, none of the things that we have belongs to us. What does that mean? That means that what they were saying is, uh, what I have belongs to Jesus. And it's for His use and His glory. Everything I have, my talents, my money, my possessions, whatever, he, he, He's Lord of it. He's Lord of it all! And if he's not Lord of all, he, he's not, if he's not Lord of all yours, he's not Lord at all. The believers were together in their walk and in their talk, in their attitudes and in their actions. The church had great fellowship in spirit and in their speaking as well. They were saying the same thing. No one spoke of selfishness, but they were dedicated to the Lord Jesus and his work, and they were looking out for one another. The Bible tells us they, of their togetherness in spirit and their testimony in their speaking. Thirdly, notice the things they had, had shared. But verse 32 again says, But they had all things in common. Uh, they had a single purpose. And they had unity that brought them together and built one another up uh, for the cause of Christ, the gospel. And the modern day church uh, would do well to take heed and learn the lessons from the early church. I mean, we need selfless saints that are sacrificing for the Savior. We need selfless saints sacrificing for the Savior. One preacher said the early church was known for the way it helped hold people together. Unfortunately, too often today, the church is known for the way we pick people apart. Ours is a critical age. We are all quick to see people's faults, slow to recognize their strengths. We are quick to criticize, hesitant to congratulate. The work of the church in such a world is to carry out the ministry of encouragement. They had a single purpose. They had unity, and they were not divided. They had all things in common. Uh, their attitude was this, not this. This was not their attitude. What is mine is mine, and I'll keep it. And what is yours is mine, and I'll take it. <laughs> they were indeed together for the glory of God, and the Lord Jesus used them. When the church is being the church, we will have biblical fellowship in the Lord. So the Bible tells us the, of the early church, their fellowship, they, were, they fellowshiped in their walk together. You got that down? They were together in heart and soul. They were walking together in life, doing, their, doing the work of the Lord. So number one, that was uh, uh, the early church had fellowship in their walk together. Number two, don't you see, uh, they had fellowship in the Word together. In the Word together. Uh, verse 33, Luke gives us the effectiveness of their witness. Look in verse 33. And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So Luke tells us of, of the effectiveness of their witness. Uh, the early church didn't just share their goods, but they shared the gospel. And we're not to be some kind of do-good organization just uh, like the Red Cross, hand, and they do a good work, that's fine, but they're not doing God's work because we're not only to share our goods, but we're to share the gospel. The only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ our Lord. They were fearless with the Word of God, and with great power they gave witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. The word great there is mega. And where we get mega means great, big, large, mighty, like a megaphone. <laughs> it projects your voice out, makes it big, makes it large. And they're that great power. The word power is the word dunamis. It means force, miraculous power. It means ability, strength. With great ability and great strength, the, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That means the Lord was over the church, and the Lord was upon the church, and the Lord worked through the church. I mean, any time the Lord Jesus is upon a church and is over a church, that, uh, the Lord Jesus will work in and through that church. The power of God was upon the saints of God as the apostles preached the gospel and testified of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. With mega power they gave witness. Does that sound like the first, 21st century church today? The word gave witness, by the way, is in the imperfect tense in the Greek language which means that their witness of the resurrection was a continual 
practice. I mean, that's all they talked about. Every conversation led to Jesus. It was, it was on their minds, in their hearts. It filled them. Everything they talked about, preached about, it led back to Jesus. Why? He's alive. Well, say, preacher, this ain't Easter. I mean, every Sunday's Easter. Are you kidding me? Jesus is alive. He conquered death, hell, and the grave. And they gave power, they gave great witness to the uh, resurrection of Jesus. When the power of our Lord is upon the church, the saints will continually bear witness of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, the resurrection sums up the gospel. Without the resurrection, there would be no gospel. Jesus didn't just die. Uh, you got to die. I've got to die. We're all going to die. But what were they saying? They were preaching the whole gospel, uh, the gospel, the true gospel, the, uh, the, the death. So what were they declaring? The resurrection, because they were declaring the resurrection, that tells me that they were declaring the death. And there has to be a death before there can be a resurrection. Amen? <laughs> And so they were declaring the death of Jesus, so they told who died and why he died. Why did he have to die? Because of sin. He paid the price for our sins. He was nailed on that old Roman rugged cross uh, for our sins. He was laid in a borrowed tomb, and on the third day, up from the grave he arose. And he lives forevermore. you telling me the resurrection, son, it's paramount. It's, it's of preeminent importance. Without the resurrection, we would all be lost in going to hell. Jesus is alive. He conquered the grave. I got good news for you. If I don't, you don't hear nothing else today, hear this. Jesus lives. The Lord is glorified through His people who practice and proclaim His Word. The only way we can be effective witnesses for, is for Jesus is that the, we have the power of God upon our lives. So that, that we learn about the effectiveness of their witness. Notice in verse 33, the evidence of His work. God was given some evidence of His work in the church. Luke tells us this, And great grace was upon them all. And great grace. I mean, they had mega power to, to declare the resurrection of Jesus, and they may had mega grace. They had big grace upon them. God's work was evidence in the lives of the men and women of faith. His favor was upon His church, and people and were one to the Lord. And, uh, and joined the church and began to worship and praise God and learn about Jesus. When God's grace is upon the saints, we will be winsome and we will be effective in our witness and in our living. And I pray that all the time. Lord, get, give me fruit from my labor. Let me know I'm being used by you somehow, some way. And Lord, I, I just want to be used by you. And I pray that the church would be fruitful, that we would be uh, glorifying Jesus in all that we do. George Brooks said the abundant grace upon the congregation means the congregation was making a favorable impression on the people of Jerusalem. The love and unity of the congregation impressed all who saw it. This was an evidence of the fact that the preaching of the apostles and the ministry of the church were effective. You will notice that the grace that was upon all did not come in small measures. It was abundant grace. Is, is, is the grace of God upon the church today in our worship? Are we worshiping together for the glory of God? In our walk, are we walking together for the glory of God? In our witness, do we witness for our Lord Jesus together? What is grace, preacher? Grace is God's unmerited, undeserved favor. You and I don't deserve it. You can't purchase it. You can't earn it. It's God's gift. Grace is God's unmerited favor. And it is represented in effect upon all believers, and it spills over uh, to others. I mean, if we've received the grace of God, we've got to be gracious to others. Amen. The church had fellowship in their walk together. Number two, the church had fellowship in the Word together. In the Word together. Thirdly, don't you see in verse 34 and verse 35, they had fellowship in their work together. In their work together. Verse 34 and 35. Notice, first of all, the decision about their possessions. Luke tells us, Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them. Luke testifies that no one among them lacked. The word lack there means deficient. They were not deficient in. They were not lacking. To, to be left in need or want or to do without. None of them among them did without. 
God used the church as they shared their possessions. They had practical Christianity. They put into practice the principles of their faith. They obeyed the word of the Lord and cared for the needs of the needy. The idea is that no family, no man, no woman, no child was neglected. No one was left without the necessities of life. No one had to face the day without food or clothing or shelter. That he needed uh, to take care of himself or his family. All of God's children were taken care of. And remember this question. What was it that caused the believers to take care of the needy? It was the love of Jesus. Uh, the duty that was laid upon them by Jesus Christ. He told them to love and to share with all those who lack the necessities of life. There was a true brotherhood, a genuine love and caring for each other in the church. They had fellowship. Well, what a testimony. There was not a church member who went without. Those, they gave to those who were in need. And the Apostle John said it this way in 1 John three seventeen. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? He said, don't, it don't abide in you. If you shut up, you see a need and you shut up your heart, the love of God's not abiding in you. They were together doctrinally in the Word. They were together spiritually, one heart and one soul. And they were together practically as they served the Lord with one another. The Bible tells us of those within the church who made a decision to sell all their, land, sell their lands and houses to help supply the need of those without. Now the Greek language signifies that they sold their lands or houses as the need arose. This was not a mass liquidation of all their assets. Did you hear me? <laughs> Later on in the book of Acts, we keep reading the book of Acts, the believers had houses and lands. They still had possessions. This was not some communistic enterprise or some commune where all the people gave everything they had to some charismatic leader. That's not what this is. Glenn Spencer had a good word, and I agree with him. He said this, Let's understand that this passage is not necessarily teaching to go out and sell everything we own and give to the poor. It's not teaching some kind of welfare where the lazy and irresponsible mooch off of others. The socialistic share the wealth philosophy that has invaded our country is contrary to Scripture. Read, real men work and feed their families if they are able. True believers have no problem with helping those who truly need help. We have no problem helping people get back on their feet. It is our Christian responsibility to help others. However, God never intended for social programs to support those who are able to work, but will not. Right. The Bible says, if you don't work, you shall not eat. Yeah. They were not forced, listen to me, they were not forced to sell their lands and houses and hand over the money. They were not forced. They made the decision as the Lord led them to sell possessions as needs arose. They were led by the Spirit. Uh, they, as a matter of fact, they said, my, these things I have don't belong to me. What they're saying, it belongs to Jesus. He's in control of it. He calls the shots. We've learned about their decision, about their possessions. Uh, secondly, don't you see the delivery of the proceeds? Look in verse 34 and verse 35 again. The Bible says, And they brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. Now, they were not only sold their lands and houses, but they brought the proceeds to the church. They gave faithfully to the work of the Lord Jesus through the church. Do you see that? They didn't sell their lands and houses and make a big profit off of it and get rich. But they sold the lands and houses to help the needy and to help the needy through the church. They brought the money to the spiritual leaders. These men were called of God and faithful to God. They were trusted by the church to handle the money. They delivered them, laid them at the apostles' feet. And by the way, it don't say apostle feet. <laughs> and then say, then Peter, he's the head of the church, you know. And so every, he, he calls all the shots. No, he don't. <laughs> It's not a one-man show. It's a one-Lord show, amen. Jesus is Lord. But they brought them to the apostles, and there was accountability uh, with the apostles. Uh, not, not, one, not one pastor should be involved in, in all the money and take, making all the decisions and distributing all. It's not, not a one-man show. Uh, they, they were distributed to the apostles, uh, in the plural. And they brought them to, uh, the church brought them so that they, they could uh, uh, help out the needs. The apostles in the first century church spoke the word of God and led the church of God and distributed to the needy. The people's given, by the way, was, was done personally and publicly. 
They come for just like we took up our offering today publicly. Now let me say this, they didn't hide in their giving, nor did they boast in their giving. I'm glad none of you did that this morning because I'd have said, what are you doing? I mean, hey, didn't, somebody didn't say, hey, look what I'm giving this morning. <laughs> we don't do that, but we just pass the offering plate. We do it, and that's between you and Jesus. Uh, but we give personally, but we also give publicly. They, are just fa they were faithful to give to the work of the Lord. They laid the proceeds at the apostles' feet. We are to have spiritually mature and responsible servants of God that lead the church and ministry in this world. Those who are responsible in handling the money are responsible before God how they have handled God's money. Be good stewards of God's money. So we've noticed their decision about the, the, their possessions, the delivery of the proceeds. Lastly, don't you see with me in verse 35, the distributing to the poor. Look in verse 35 again. The Bible says, and they distributed to each as any anyone had need. The early church was a giving church. They had practical Christianity. They saw needs and they met needs. They distributed. That, that word means to give out throughout a crowd. It means to deal out, to distribute, to, to divide. They didn't give out. Uh, they gave out faithfully. They, they gave out and they didn't hold back. Uh, they shared instead of stored. They helped instead of hoarded. They were a blessing instead of a burden. Not only were they united, they were unselfish. This passage uh, tells us, uh, gives us a distinct Christian view of possessions, which centers not in ownership, but in stewardship. Not in creed, but need. Not in fad, but in family. We're the family of God. And the people of God uh, that, that, that were in need were taken care of. Matter of fact, James says this in James chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Well, I spoke a good word to them, preacher. Well, it takes more than a good word. They need, they're in some, they need some physical help. And James says, what does it profit? What kind of faith is that? They distributed to each one and anyone who had need within the church. They gave to those who were in genuine need. That tells me, listen to this for I close. They obviously investigated each situation and responded properly. We're not to give out to every Tom, Dick, and Harry who comes by wanting a handout. Did you know, I know it's going to blow some of your mind, but there are scam artists <laughs> in the world. There are people who make a living going to church to church getting handouts, and they don't have need. They may have some need because of their foolishness and because of their laziness and because of their... Uh, some of them may have a genuine need. Who knows? But you know what we do? And, try, and a lot of times, and Miss Mary testified this, I try to share the gospel with them. We try to share the gospel. They don't hear about the good news. They just want to have a handout. They don't want to hear about Jesus. Or if they say they're saved, well, I, I'm saved, but I don't go to a church. That's the first thing I say. Do you have a church family? Because if you have a church family and we know there's a need, that church family will help meet that need. If they're a biblical church, what are you doing coming to us if you have a church family? <laughs> And so there's so many scam artists, man. It, it takes spiritual discernment and wisdom. He said, Preacher, don't you think we need to help people? Yes. Yeah, but in the Bible, just like I read that, that person knew there was a need. They knew they were naked and destitute of food. And you tell them to be warm and filled and go off. That's, that's neglectful. That's ungodly. The Good Samaritan, when he came upon um, the man that was beaten and left for half dead, was robbed. You know, the priest, the preacher that day come by and passed over on the other side. He had time to fool with that mess. He had to get down to Jerusalem. The other, the other one, a uh, Pharisee come by and passed, or the lawyer came by and passed on the other side. But the good Samaritan, when he came by, he stopped and helped the man, uh, cleaned up his wound, put him on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and paid the man and said, if there's any other charges, when I come back, I'll take care of that too. Jesus said, which one of, uh, of those men were a, a friend to him, was a neighbor? It was the Good Samaritan. Well, the Good Samaritan came across the man who had needs. And when we come across people who have genuine needs, man, be help, man, help them in the name of Jesus. We have so many. I mean, I'm up here all... As a, I'm just telling you from uh, American, tell you too, we, have, we get bombarded sometimes when people come in, is this a legitimate need? Uh, and we've had people that come here and we've helped them and uh, uh, told, told us they were doing something, found out they wouldn't uh, later on and they come back again. Did you help them again? I said, oh, that, that, you lied to us the first time. You didn't tell us the truth. Oh, I, I forgot I'd been here. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> 
You ever heard some, some people tell so many lies, they forget they tell a lie, they think they're telling the truth, they forget how many lies. And when you keep lying, it's hard to cover up for all the lies you've told. We're not to support those who are in sin and rebellion. Uh, uh, the fact is, though, that the early church was a generous church. They were saved by the grace of God, and they were servants to the glory of God. Let me ask you this morning, do we have practical Christianity? Are we ministering in the name of Jesus and to the needs of those around us? David Jeremiah had a good word. He said, we might conclude that the Jerusalem church lived with open hands. From their open hands, others could take what, what they needed. And into their open hands, God could put more resources to share. An open-handed church is a generous church. Are we serving Jesus in biblical fellowship? I'm talking about biblical inreach. Where, where we are of one heart and one soul? Is the gospel of Jesus Christ the main thing at First Baptist Church? Are we giving testimony of the resurrection of Jesus Christ with power? And is God's great grace upon His church today? Are we together in spirit? Are we together in serving and ministering to the needs of those who have need? I, I think we go as far as... I'm just going to say this now before I close. Uh, I think we go so far, uh, uh, maybe it's cause of pride. Maybe we need to lay down our pride. You know, pride is sin. We, got, we go, sometimes we go to the opposite extreme. I mean, we could be having heart surgery and nobody knows about it. <laughs> Somebody, I mean, go, uh, Joe's been in the hospital five days. Well, I didn't know about it. Hey, I, you know what I, I told you when I first came here? I am not a mind reader. I can't even understand my mind, much less yours. <laughs> And we can't read minds. I mean, if we don't know needs, we can't help meet needs. But I, mean, I believe this. I've pastored this church 11 years. I believe your, these, our people here want to help meet needs. And, and when they found a genuine need, they'd come together and do the work, or, or whatever needs to have taken place to help meet needs. Do we have a Christ honor and testimony in our homes and on our jobs and in our community? Would you today surrender to Jesus? repent of sin, be restored to fellowship with God and, and the church. The reason too many people are out of fellowship with the church is because they're out of fellowship with God. And they, they're deceived. They think they're in right fellowship with God, but they're not in fellowship with His people. Maybe it's because something that they did or somebody did something to them and they won't forgive them. Did you know unforgiveness is a sin as well? You say, well, I didn't do that to me. They did that. Well, you're doing it to them, though, because you're uh, not forgiving them. Well, I didn't ask for forgiveness. Can I tell you, forget unforgiveness is like a cancer. It'll eat away at your soul. Surrender to Jesus today. Seek the Lord. Serve the Lord. Rely on the Lord. Let's be intentional in biblical inreach. How can we ensure inreach? By building up the body of Christ through discipleship, but also through fellowship. Let's have fellowship. Uh, well, I think we've learned a little bit about how the church had fellowship. Did they eat together? I'm sure they did. But that's not true. Not only biblical fellowship. Did they greet one another? Shake everybody's hand? Yeah, in our fellowship time, we need to do that. Show, we, show each other we love one another. Catch up a little bit and pray for one another. Exhort one another. We need that. But we also need to, to walk together. We also need to be in the Word together. We also need to work together for the kingdom of God. Father, in the name of Jesus, today, would you bless the message of fellowship today, Lord, to each here today, uh, young and old, Lord, I pray that we'd examine our own hearts. Lord, if there's anything that's hindering our fellowship with Jesus, that we would confess it today and repent of it. Lord, if there's anything that's hindering our fellowship with the church today, Lord, that we'd know that we're not right with you because of some attitude or some bitterness or some feeling that we're holding on to that's hindering our fellowship in the church. And God, I pray that your people would have strong biblical fellowship with great power. Lord, the Christians would be able to give witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, that great grace would be upon your church. Lord, we're in desperate need of the grace of God. And Lord, we just confess we don't deserve it. And Lord, we know that we can't earn it, but we are in need of your grace daily. Lord, be gracious to us. And may, may your grace be upon us. And Lord, may others see that we're gracious men and women of God out in the community, that we might be winsome, that we might have an effective testimony and witness in our community for Jesus. So Lord, bless the fellowship at First Baptist Church. May we be one in the bond of love. We sang it earlier, Lord. May we be one in the bond of love. Draw all people to yourself in this invitation time is my prayer. Lord, do a work in our hearts and lives in our homes today. And it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me all over the building?